Health. Specifically, physical health is something that many of us take for granted. Now, I'm not referring to the health you maintain by eating vegetables or even exercising, but the kind of health that is determined by your DNA. Now, a person with an abnormality in their DNA, such as a small mutation or even a missing chromosome, may have a genetic disorder. And depending on the genetic condition and what the severity is, it can be the difference between life or death. But before we continue, I'd like to introduce Matthew Porter. Now, Matt is a good-looking guy, 18 years old, Caucasian, well-built, glasses, brown eyes, and brown hair. Now, you're probably thinking, why are you talking about this guy? Well, in my description of Matt, I didn't mention that he also uses a wheelchair, which is on account of his genetic disorder known as hemophilia. And in Matt's case, his hemophilia is one of the most severe cases in the nation. So, this audio documentary is set around one not-so-simple question. How has hemophilia affected Matt's life and the lives of those around him? So, who is Matthew Porter? Right now, I am a full-time student and I do photography for elemental motorsports. And you'll often find him on the computer, busy studying, or talking to his three doormates. <laughs> now, what does he enjoy? Driving cars, um, music, art, photography. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. So now that we know a little bit about Matt, let's talk to a couple of experts on hemophilia, Matt's parents. His mom is Debbie Porter, who's a certified public accountant. And there's Matt's dad, Joe Porter, who is a production business proposals home manager. Or to simplify, an engineer. To start off, what is hemophilia? Here's Debbie. It's a genetic disorder that is a lack of a protein in your body that controls clotting of the blood. And there's different types of hemophilia and different severities of hemophilia. Matt gets into a little more detail. If your factor level is under 1% of the normal person's factor level, because say normal person 100%. Mine is typically zero, so that means there's no clotting going on. But in Matt's case, things get a little more complicated. Joe explains. If you have severe and zero, you have a chance of also developing an inhibitor. And then if you have an inhibitor, then the clotting factors don't work for you, and you have to take other what they call bypass agents to try to form a clot. So what happens is that an immune system can develop antibodies to fight against the clotting factor, and the clotting factor is read as a foreign substance by the antibodies. So the strength of the antibodies is known as an inhibitor. So I am unable to take the, the regular medicine you would typically give a factor uh, hemophilia A patient, which would make them almost normal because it's factor eight and that's what your body needs. So this means that Matt uses two other medicines that kind of work around it, but it doesn't work as well. So it's much, it's almost like a different disease. And how is the medicine taken? Um, it's, it, it's intravenous. So with the syringe, needle, every day, so. Every day? Yep. And the cost of the medication isn't cheap either. In fact, it's very expensive. We got right now, one dose of one of the medications is $7,000. Yeah, I, my company, uh, they, at one time when he was in the hospital, called and said, by the way, he just exceeded his health benefits. And I'm like, I just talked to you guys last week and you said there was no problem. They said, well, we didn't look at the cost of the medication, which is extreme, and we should have. And when we looked at the cost of medication, it turns out you've exceeded his lifetime limit. And so he was in the hospital and we found out we had no insurance. Turns out that within six months, Joe's company had paid $2 million for Matt's health care. So now, Matt is insured with Medicaid through the state of California. As a taxpayer, I thank you. Now, how is hemophilia passed on? It's usually uh, transferred from the mother on the X chromosome. And the X chromosome actually has the indicator to, for your body to create the factors. It's called an X-linked recessive. If you're a male, you'll have one Y, one X. If you get an X with that defect, if you will, mm -hmm. then your body will have it. If you're a female, you could have a bad X and a good X, 
and usually you're at most time there you will not the female will not be hemophiliac but they will be a carrier in addition to the disease being passed on the severity of the hemophilia runs in the family so if the defect is severe, every person will be severe. Every male will be severe. And his inhibitor is one of the worst inhibitors they've ever seen. So he is about as bad as it could get. Well, it's less than a dozen patients at his severity probably in the nation. Before we continue, there's a major misconception that needs to be addressed. Hemophilia and the bleeding is not your concern would not be somebody bleeding externally any more than anybody else would bleed from a cut. It is internal joint damage is what occurs and internal muscle, soft tissue, and joint bleeding. And severe hemophiliacs, especially ones with inhibitors, tend to have target joints that are problem joints that can experience reduced range of motion and loss of muscle mass to start. My body, if something injures something, which happens to everybody all the time, but they don't notice it because your body fixes it, my body can't clot to fix it, so I have internal hemorrhaging often. So the worry is... He could have a spontaneous bleed, which means there's a blood vessel broken in the joint or that area, and it is bleeding. So what happens is the joint or the area will swell. Um, if it's in a joint, it'll push the bones apart, causing severe pain. Um, once there's, uh, you know, he'll clot, he'll treat extra, He'll use compression, he'll ice for the pain and the swelling. Um, eventually, when the bleeding is under control, it gets reabsorbed by the body, but it leaves iron deposits. And the iron then will deteriorate the bone. Yeah, if it's in an organ or brain, it's fatal. Given Matt's condition, he's been through a lot, especially on the physical side. And the next part is just a taste of what he's had to deal with. Okay, this is weird, but the only thing I really remember from being really, really, really little is I remember when I had my club feet correction surgery. To prep for bilateral club feet, they basically take a kid and they take your foot and basically his foot were in and up. So if he was climbing up a tree, it'd be perfect, but he'd never been able to walk on. So what they do is they actually take the baby and they take the foot and hold it and they basically move it to the kid screams really, really bad and then they cast it in that spot. I just remember that the way I remember it is that the the amnesia didn't work as well as it should have. So I think I was semi-conscious during it. So that's how I remember it. <laughs> when you have a kidney bleed, and he's had several of them uh, throughout this time, but when you get one, your urine has uric kinate in it, which actually has stuff to stop you from clotting because you don't want to clot. Your urine basically will not clot because you don't want to clot right there. Right, yeah. Well. The problem is, is, and that's made in the urine and, and then the kidneys. So when you have a bleed in your kidneys, it's made to not clot. So now you're peeing massive amounts of blood. And he was in so much pain. He screamed for a month. He couldn't eat for a month because he vomited constantly from the pain. And they, nothing, I mean, nothing they gave him could stop the pain. By the age of four, Matt needed to have a major knee procedure. And he was the youngest patient they did that on. They, they used to only do it on adults, and they brought him in, and they expected him just to lay still when he was four years old. And they'd never done it to a child, and it was a needle that was extremely long. And they had to stick it in, and they have to set it in there. And then this other guy comes, goes to a safe, and pulls out the actual radioactive isotope, brings over and injects it, and they put it underneath the gamma ray thing. But he sat there screaming, and it took us probably six of us to hold him down, or else they couldn't do it. And then eventually we got him to where he would do it there a couple times that they would knock him out to do it. Actually, the worst hospitalization was actually because he had um, clotted off his subclavian from the line. And we didn't know it, but from a, from a previous line, he had clotted off the other subclavian. And your subclavian is your main veins that take your blood back to your heart. Basically, all the blood backed up into his head and his upper body and he was in intensive care for three months. I'd bleed and then within a couple, like a week or two, re-bleed and it would not stop. Mm -hmm. So I had to get open synovectomies, which is a really huge surgery because they literally open up your leg and scrape the inside of your bone out to get the stuff that it bleeds into out. So 
it was really painful and I was in the hospital for a few months and but it really helped with the bleeding but I lost a lot of range of motion and stuff so I still when I can walk on a good day my legs are still bent he, he screamed a lot um, most of the town probably heard Matthew at some point um, and he it was very weird for him not to be screaming when he was very very young before Matt was born, Debbie and Joe knew 10 weeks into the pregnancy that Matt would have hemophilia. And how did they feel? Scared. I would say scared more than anything. Actually, we were most afraid of the AIDS. Because Debbie's father, who also was a severe hemophiliac, had received the AIDS virus from a tainted blood transfusion. And in the 1980s, he passed away from it. After finding out about Matt, Debbie and Joe then interviewed many doctors and were assured that the clotting factors were safe and no longer a worry. But another aspect to the story is how did this affect not only Matt's life, but his loved ones as well. Now, in addition to his parents, Matt also has two sisters, 23-year-old Brianna, who's the oldest and a full-time college student, and there's his younger sister, Casey, who's 16. Here's Brianna. I remember calling my mom and I, he was in the hospital and I don't remember why I called her or what it was about, but I just remember her like, like getting r really pissed off and like just like snapping. And she just like was on the phone and she was like, your brother is about to die right now. Like you need to stop. And like, just like hung up and I'm like, and I didn't, they, they really kept all that away from me. They didn't let me know when it was getting really bad. It was different than most other childhoods because he and my parents would always be gone at the hospital and then my sister and I would just be kind of left here to grow up. <laughs> but some usually they tried to keep one parent home to watch us, but didn't always work out that way. But it was interesting. And that was Casey. Yeah, we lived in the hospital for three months several times and it affected Debbie's job where she basically could not go back to work, uh, professionally work out of the house. It affected my job and choices that we had to make on far, the far things we could do it. Yeah, hospital time, there's nothing like it. I remember like this one time, um, I was at the, I was in, playing a softball game and I, I hit a home run and it was like the one time my dad wasn't there because he was in the hospital, but we had like family friends there, so. Our family really stepped up and family friends really stepped up. Um, it would definitely, like at school, people would be like, oh, you're the guy in the wheelchair, sister. And then I've been like, yeah. And then people would be like, kind of thinking I'm kind of weird. And, As yeah. opposed to being Casey Porter, you're the sister. As Matt's sister. <laughs> okay. To everyone. <laughs> Still am. I just remember like um, coming home from the hospital one time and I was like about to cry in the car because it was when my brother was really bad and um, my dad looked at me and he was like, you need to be strong for your sister. So like, I like held back my tears, but I would, I would be upset a lot at night. Let's lighten things up a bit and revisit some good memories with Matt. As a little boy, I wore, I wore a helmet around and knee pads and I always had bruises, so. <laughs> I never. I always knew I was a little bit different. <laughs> right, so you didn't have to have somebody tell you. Yeah. Okay. I got to look at my sisters like, I'm, they're not wearing helmets. But what? Okay. I don't know why they're not doing that, but great. He used to run around uh, in the backyard with that basic same outfit on all the time. Clear's memories, he had a little yellow wheelchair that he got when he was three. He was in preschool and he started having a lot of problems joint problems and they he got this little it was bright yellow wheelchair looked like a bumblebee and we'd take him to the park I'd take him to the park and he would start at the top of, and, and now he's three I have a six month old too so here's me at the park with the six month old and him in this little and and he would find like the highest hill at the park and launch himself and besides that, he learned how to throw himself into a wheelie. He's three and he has a very severe bleeding disorder. <laughs> and I would turn around and he'd be barreling down the hill somewhere in a wheelie. <laughs> in this yellow wheelchair. Well, as, as a little kid in elementary school, I had a power wheelchair, which had like the things on the back where people can like stand on. So I've always like had girls like riding on the bike in my chair, like, hey, you wanna ride? One of the most frightening things for me was we were at uh, La Mirada Regional Park 
and it had rained, so the grass was wet, and he was in his power wheelchair, which weighed probably with him in at 350. And he was decided, we were playing frisbee golf, and he decided to uh, go down this one hill that was too steep. And he started sliding down sideways down this hill. And at the bottom of the hill was a little wash concrete little V that they had put in the, to run off the water. And as soon as he hit that, I knew that wheelchair was flipping. And I don't know how to this day I ran fast enough, but I was somehow able to, I was way behind him when I started. I caught up to him, I got in front of him and was able to brace myself running and trying to slow him down and stopped him right before he hit that cement thing. But I thought for sure Debbie was gonna kill me if I came home and he flipped that wheelchair. <laughs> He was always uh, jumping curbs and whatnot in his electric wheelchair, hauling butt around. He'd play handball in his electric wheelchair. He's pretty good. He was a badass. That was David, Matt's best friend. And here's Catherine Vance, Matt's girlfriend, who even though they've known each other for five years, didn't start dating until a few months ago. He came up and I showed him around like Elsinore, like the lake and stuff, and then we went to like a petting zoo. It's not really like a petting zoo, but it's like a farm, like a dairy. And they have like animals there and you could buy food to feed them and stuff. So we were like feeding goats and stuff. It was really cool. We also one time went on and ordered all this fishing gear and all this little stuff. And we had it all over the hospital room. And we had a Hot Wheels and fishing stuff and you name it. It was all over this room and people would walk in this room. It looked like he had lived there for years. I guess like when he was moving in on the first day, I was like up to the dorms, I was like, I felt like a proud mother, kind of. <laughs> and I like, I don't know, I just like, I remember making his bed and everything and just was like, proud, I guess. High when he graduated high school, I like, almost started crying. <laughs> I don't know why. But the most commonly shared best memories were of when Matthew would come home from the hospital. Either whether I'd bring him home or Debbie would bring him home, it's like, you know, the family's together. So what kind of guy is Matthew Porter? Well, let's start with Casey. There's no word to describe Matt. <laughs> Cause even though he has his disability, he like, y you don't picture him as having it. Like you kind of see him differently, like as normal person, which is pretty shocking to me. He is definitely a character. Um, he's a really cool guy. Like, you know, he, it's really cool to see someone in his situation that does so well with it. He really does make the best of it. And he even jokes about it too. And it, it's really cool to see someone that's so upbeat and like so high spirited and so just like eager to, to try and do everything that he can, you know? <laughs> well, he's very creative, very talented. He is, very funny, I'm sure you've realized. He has a very good sense of humor. The things when I think of Matt, I think of like how outgoing he is and optimistic. Like he sees everything really like bright and um, he, he's really like, he's really passionate towards like everything that he does, which is, I really like, I don't know, it's cool. When he laughs, <laughs> you know he's laughing. You know, it's a very loud, bold laugh. And so that's one thing. He doesn't complain. We say yeah. if he ever complains, I know something's really, really That's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't complain when he was little. He never, he never really complained. He would scream, yeah. but he's forgiving. He's artistic. He's smart, but he is very stubborn. And he is one of these people that is just stuck in his ways. Um, Matthew is cocky. He is, <laughs> um, he knows everything. He's a little devil. I mean, ever since he was little, he was a little devil. I mean, you look at pictures of him as a kid and you can see it in his eyes. He's just a little devil, <laughs> but it's in a good way. I mean, thank God, I think he has to have that. And the stubbornness probably comes from what he had to go through. And, you know, he's, he takes a lot of pain, um, which, you know, he's had to handle. 
Uh, you know, I've noticed about him that he's he's not one to um, you know everyone has a soft side, but he's not one to show it like at all. And sometimes I think that's probably one of the, one of the only flaws I can see. You know, is that he uh, he's stubborn. He he can be very stubborn at times, and he won't he won't let things show. Even if you can tell he's feeling them, you can tell he's thinking them. He won't. He'll try his best not to let them show, and he'll deny everything. And it's like, you know, sometimes you just you you want him to be real with you. If you were to ask me how I would describe myself, and if I were to describe myself in like one word. I'd probably say I was resilient because every day is a challenge and so far like I work my way through it and like people see me around they don't they don't notice that I'm challenged like I am. So I would say I'm resilient and it's working out. So we've had Matt's loved ones talk about him, but let's switch it around and have Matt talk about them. And you were saying that kind of David's kind of helped you with mm -hmm. getting through things. Do you, is there anything in particular that you remember? Um, well, he he's probably the funniest person in my life. When I'm around him, I laugh a ton. Like, we can't stop cracking jokes and stuff. So, I mean, he's come down to visit me in the hospital, stuff like that. So, I think what we said earlier, laughter is the best medicine. He's helped me through that way. And now, Catherine. Like, she's one of the reasons to just keep pushing on and stuff, because, I mean, she's always there, so. She's motivationally changed me, I would say, I guess you could say. Last but not least, Matt's family. Well, my mom, she's very caring. She does anything to help me. Um, Cause I think she saw when her dad go through and she didn't want me to do that. And then my dad, he, um, I think he's proud of what I've gone through and how I've dealt with it. And my sisters, I think, I think they're proud to see what I've gone through. I mean, they've always, joked about like I get more attention than them but I think they realize that's necessary so so I think they're there for me and how does this change one's outlook of life oh I think it just definitely makes you a stronger person and makes you makes different things important to you than is important to other people. I mean, you learn to be grateful for health, to be grateful for small things, you know, to be grateful to sleep in your own bed at night and not a hospital bed. I mean, it just, you know, you're, you learn to be happy with so much less. Things that seem like such big tragedies to people are nothing to me. Like I, it's hard to, you know, sometimes it, it's irritating to me, but mostly I think I have much better coping mechanisms than both, most people. And that's, and I see that as a good thing. I mean, there's people that would say that's a bad thing, but I, I, I think it's, it's good. Yeah, when, when, he, when Brianna was born, uh, my mom called and she said, well, is she healthy? And I said, well, yeah, you know, of course. And you know, you never really appreciate that until you have a kid with a problem. So now when I hear somebody has a kid, it's like, first thing is, is everything okay? Are they healthy? Because they really don't know how lucky they are if they have a kid that's healthy. What would be your words of wisdom for, I guess, a kid that's just kind of starting out in life and has seen the feeling and having a hard time? I would just say, to don't consider yourself different from anybody else because we all have our problems and that um, hit, hit, growing up it'll 
make who he is and he'll like himself better for who he is. My outlook on life, I mean, I think is as good or better as most people's, even though I have this disease. And that's just because I've re come to realize that everybody has their problems, whether it be financially or mentally or family or physical, not just physical. Today, I've realized that hemophilia and having it has made me who I am. So if I had a choice of having it or not, I'd still want it because I would be somebody else. I would say that uh, him having this disability kind of, even though it seems like it tears the family apart, it kind of brings us closer in a way because we all have to deal with it. There's no way around it. So it could be a good thing in a way. If I could describe it in one word, I think my life would be um, testing. Like everything I've gone to has kind of tested who I am. And I think so far I'm passing that test. And that's the life of Matt Porter up to now. Concerning the future, he wants to get a biology degree and then go to medical school where he'd like to do research on hemophilia. So what have we learned? Well, I would say an appreciation for health and the little things. Now tomorrow, you may totally forget that you listened to this, but I hope that you don't. Remember, every day we have is a gift, and if it's in good health, it's something to appreciate. Big thanks to everyone that helped me in this project. Debbie, Joe, Brianna, and Casey Porter, Catherine Vance, David Feltenberger, and of course, Matt Porter. My name is Weston Neen, and I'm a radio television film student at California State University Fullerton. Thanks for listening.